the technical co-founder of a company called Chosen FYI. We are an executive recruiting company out of Boston. Um, if you want to reach out to me with anything you know, about the talk or about Shades or about anything you're interested about, you can uh, reach me at that email address or you can find me on GitHub. There's more contact information there. Um, but about me, uh, at my core, I would say that I am a, a functional programmer. Um, I, I have the tattoo to prove it. Uh, <laughs> I'm really excited about functional programming. I have been for a very long time. And uh, I started working with React maybe four years ago. Uh, and I was really excited about how it brought a lot of these functional ideas into the framework. And that, that was really what brought me in at the beginning. But it's been so amazing to watch how the huge community has built around it and how many people have, uh, who might not have ever seen these ideas before, have started to sort of embrace these functional ideas. And it's been, it's been really cool to watch and to see all these people here uh, excited about what is at its core a functional framework is, is very exciting to me. Um, but enough mushy stuff. Uh, I am here today to talk to you about a library called uh, one sec. Shades. <laughs> Jay, nope, it's way too dark, way too dark. <laughs> uh, Shades uh, provides functional lenses for JavaScript. Lenses are a path into an object that can be used to either read a value out of that path from the object or write a value into that object immutably. So not actually mutating the underlying object, but creating a new object. Uh, this project came about uh, because I, in a past life, was a Haskell programmer. And Haskell is where lenses came from. And uh, when I came to JavaScript and I saw everyone was using Redux and it was really just all immutable programming, uh, I thought, wow, you know, lenses would be perfect for this. I wonder if anyone has built this for JavaScript. And so I went out and I searched, and it turns out, yes, a lot of people had. I found over 30 libraries <laughs> that had implemented lenses for JavaScript. But every single one of them had implemented them exactly like Haskell lenses. And some of you might know, JavaScript is not Haskell. <laughs> They are different languages. And it's very clunky if you're working with a JavaScript library and it's asking you to implement a functor type class instance. So I thought it would be great if there was a lens library that was built JavaScript first. And that's where Shades came out. Uh, I've been using it in production for two years. Uh, it's battle tested. I really love it. And I hope that by the end of this, some of you guys love it too. Um, so before I, I talked about sort of this problem with it's, it's about immutable updates and, and what that problem is, um, give you a more clear idea of what I'm talking about. Let's imagine we have a store that is kind of this nested object. A uh, store has users. Users have you know, their name, whether they're a gold member. They have their list of posts, which have titles and likes. And I want to update this store. I want to pick, let's say, the first post and I want to capitalize the title. Uh, if I'm using mutation, this is very straightforward. Uh, you know, it's a little, it's a little clunky because I have to, to name this path twice, but at the end of the day, it's, it's straightforward, it's clean, but it uses mutation. And as functional programmers, we hate mutation. So, hey, we'll, we'll do an immutable update, we'll use all the new goodies, we'll use object assign and stuff, it'll be great. Wow. That looks terrible. <laughs> and what's more, I think the worst thing about this is that you can't really tell what's happening. Can anybody spot? That is the actual update. We're capitalizing the title. That is so buried in there, it's very hard to find. Wouldn't it be great if there was a way to write this immutable update as if it was you know, much cleaner and as if with the sort of the syntax of immutable update? Don't worry. There is. But before we get there, I want to give you a quick recap on currying, function currying, that is. Uh, function currying is actually a pretty simple idea. Uh, it simply says, we're going to take a function 
that takes two arguments, uh, A and B, and produces a result C, and we're gonna transform it into a function that takes a single argument A and produces a function that'll take the next argument B and produce the result C. And this didn't change the mechanics of behavior at all, it simply changed the way we called the function. But you'll see this actually introduces, uh, it can allow us to eliminate a lot of unnecessary clutter and unnecessary arrow functions from our code. So a quick example uh, to, to sort of, if this still seems too abstract, uh, here's a, an add function. It simply you know, takes two numbers, adds them together. Great, this, is, this should be pretty straightforward. Uh, and we can call it exactly as you would expect, pass it two arguments. Let's translate this into a curried function. We now have a function that takes a single argument, A, and produces a function that when called with a second argument B, will then return that result. So calling this looks a little different, right? Now we can call add with just a single argument, and we'll get back a function. For in this case, we'll get back a function that will add five to whatever input we call it with. Uh, we can do add five, six, and get the exact behavior from before, but now we have this ability to specialize add with an argument. We can sort of fix its first argument and get back a function that'll take any argument and add five to that. You might be looking at this and saying like, I don't, I don't know why you would wanna do this. This seems kinda weird and clunky, but I put it to you that if you're a React programmer, you've probably done this a lot because it's really common in React to pre-bind a function argument. You know, imagine you have a, a profile widget that has a comment box, and the comment box wants the ability to add a post for a user. But the comment box doesn't care about users, it cares about text and emojis and, I don't know, whatever kids are using these days. Um, so the parent, the profile widget, will instead, it will pre-bind that user argument when it passes the function to the comment box. Uh, function bind is really just the poor man's function currying. And I, I say it's the poor man's because it's uglier. It, it's kind of clunky that there's this null that's in there, and if we had written our function to be curried, this looks a lot prettier. Um, now, you might have a complaint that uh, the writing a curried function looks pretty nasty, but with uh, arrow functions, this actually becomes really, really clean and really, really short. Uh, instead of writing this, we just write this. It's really not more complicated than writing a normal arrow function, but it's gonna allow us to eliminate a lot of unnecessary functions from our code. And if you wanna see some, some more patterns for that, please come and talk to me afterwards. I, I'll show you some cool stuff. But for now, we're gonna move on to lenses and uh, see how they work. So, I promise I'm not gonna try to teach you any category theory here. I'm just gonna show you some pictures and I think we're gonna, I think we're gonna understand because it's not really that complicated of a concept, despite what your Haskell friend might tell, might tell you. So let's assume I have this object foo. Foo is this blue square, and foo has a sub property that is this yellow circle. It's called bar. So this is just a normal JavaScript object, so foo.bar is just gonna give me that yellow circle. What we can create, I told you before sort of that lenses are paths through objects. So we could create a lens for this bar property uh, that would really be kind of an arrow that is pointing to the bar property. And that's really what our lens is. Uh, to go a little more concrete, exactly what a lens is, is it's just an object with two functions. Uh, the first function is get. It takes some object of type S and produces a object of type A. And then the second is a, uh, a function mod that takes as an argument a function that goes from A to B, and then it takes a function from type S and produces a value of type T. Clear? Not at all. <laughs> no one should be able to get away with showing you something with this many type variables and say it's okay. 
let's use, let's use our foo bar example. Let's, let's look at what a bar lens would be using our, our pictures. Get is a function that takes this foo bar and it extracts the bar out of it, right? Get is our extractor. Mod, mod is gonna take a, a function, sort of an updater function, that goes from bars to quuxes. And <coughs> we're gonna then take a, a whole foo bar and we're gonna return a foo quux. So we have taken this updater function and we have applied it inside of the foo bar. We're not gonna get away from this foo bar baz quux lingo. It's the only way that we're gonna make heads or tails of this. <laughs> so uh, now we have a more concrete idea. Let's look at the actual code for implementing a lens. Uh, it's just a function. It's just an object with some functions. There's no magic around it. Uh, get is a function that takes a foo, and what does it do? It extracts the foo bar. Mod, it takes a function f that goes from uh, bars, to baz or bars to quuxes. It takes a foo. And what do we do? Well, we have to create a whole new foo, so we, we object assign, we, we copy over everything except for the bar. The bar, we're gonna take the old bar, pass it to our function, update it, and the new bar is gonna be the result of that function. Seems straightforward. Uh, so now the question is, how do we use lenses? I mean, obviously we could just directly use this object. It has a couple of functions, but we'll find that that doesn't actually save us anything. Uh, instead, shades export some top-level functions that will let us sort of execute these behaviors. Uh, they'll look really familiar. Get is a function that looks just like the get on a, on a lens, except it takes the lens as its first argument. So with our foo bar example, get would take the bar lens, and then it would take the foo bar, and it would give us back the bar. It will apply the, the lens to that object. Uh, mod is the same way. We'll give it a lens uh, for bar. We'll give it an updater function for bars. Then we'll give it a foo bar, and it'll give us back a foo quux. Uh, yeah. Uh, so actually using this, using the, this actual code is exactly how you would expect. You would, you would get extract, get, and mod. Here's our, our foo uh, that has a bar of 42. Uh, we can get using our bar lens, and we'll get 42. We can modify using our bar lens and pass this incrementer function, and we will actually get back a new, you know, foo quux, you could call it, with uh, the new value but again, this is all immutable, so our original foo bar is totally safe, is totally clean. So that's really our, our quick tour of lenses. All they are are these functions that know how to extract values and modify values immutably. Um, and we've seen most of what we need. The only downside is this does not seem very helpful at all. This seems like a way more verbose way of doing something that we could have done with just object accesses and assigns. Don't worry. We still got some tricks up our sleeve. The biggest one is that get and mod can compose lenses together. So to, to see what this means, let's go back to our, our beloved foo bar example. But now bar has a sub property that is this green diamond. We'll call it baz. Uh, and again, you know, foo bar baz now refers to this, this uh, green diamond. So we have our bar lens, but what we need now is a baz lens, okay? So let's get to work on writing that. And we'll notice it looks pretty familiar. In fact, this is the baz lens, that's the bar lens. Did you miss it? <laughs> this is really nice. This actually shows us two important things about lenses. Uh, the first is that this baz lens, whoops, this Baz lens doesn't know that it is deeply inside of this structure. It's completely abstracted from its context. Uh, it knows nothing about its parent. All it knows is how to extract and update a Baz. So this lets us know that we can use the same lens in very different contexts because it's not tied to its environment. 
Additionally, we also know whenever we see code that looks this similar, we think, hmm, I wonder if we could abstract this somehow. And you're getting ahead of me, so stay with me. Um, as I said, get and mod can compose lenses. So if I call get with my bar and my baz lens, and then pass in my foobar baz, I will get the baz out of the structure. I've reached all the way in and pulled out this deeply nested item. Mod is the same way. If I compose these two lenses, and then I pass a function that goes from bazes to quuxes, I can now take a, a whole foobar baz and transform it into a foobar quux without having a function that knows anything about them. I just had a simple little updater, and I was able to reconstruct this whole structure behind it. Uh, using them is, is just what you would expect. You simply just pass in multiple lenses, and get and mod will know how to uh, compose them together. So now this is a little more compelling. This is a little more interesting, but you're probably saying, and this is great, but I don't want to write 100 bar, baz, quux, whatever lenses. Like, that seems really annoying. And I'd say, great, you know, don't. Because we have a nice little shorthand. Uh, if you pass in a string, we'll assume that that's a property. And not just a JavaScript object property. It could be an immutable object, immutable JS object. It could be a, a Baobab or a Mori object. No matter what, or any combination of the two. And we will be able to, to figure out the right operation to apply. Uh, additionally, if we have uh, an array, you could simply give us a number, and we'll treat that as an index. And again, this works for arrays, or it works for immutable JS lists, or any other construct that has a set and a get field as our, as our last default. So now we don't need to write any of these boring lenses. They can sort of be inferred for us. So using this, let's actually go back and look at our, our update from before. What does this look like now? Remember, we wanted to, to find the first user, the first post, and we wanted to capitalize its title. Boom. What's nice about this code is that not only is it shorter than this code, it's much easier to read. It's much easier to understand. What am I doing? Well, I'm going to modify uh, the users, the first user, the posts, the first post, and I'm going to modify the title. What am I going to do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass in a title to title function, capitalize. And what do I want to apply that to? The store. Boom. I'm done. We look at it. This is even cleaner than our mutable example was, but this is an immutable update. So now this looks pretty great. I think at this point, I would think, this, I, I'm interested in this. I would use it. And if that's all it did, I would think that was great. But there's more. <laughs> because if you think back to these lenses, I mean, every lens we've looked at has just been a property access. But when we defined what a lens was, it was just an object with a couple functions. And so really, we're, we're not limited to accessing a property. We can do anything that a function can do. And functional programmers will tell you, functions can do quite a lot. So, one thing we can do is a virtual lens. Virtual lenses are lenses that focus on a property that doesn't actually exist on the object. Not only that, not only can we extract values that are perhaps derived from other value, but we can write in a meaningful way to properties that don't exist on a source object. To give us a motivating example, Let's imagine I have a temperature in Celsius, but I want to view it in Fahrenheit. Well, I'm going to start off with a couple conversion functions, one to take Fahrenheit into Celsius and one to go back. And now I'm going to write my lens. So the first thing is get. And remember, get has always been our extractor function. But how do we extract a temperature in Fahrenheit from a temperature in Celsius? Well, we can really think of that as, well, we're going to get a temperature in Celsius, and we're just going to convert it to Fahrenheit. OK, that makes sense. 
mod, mod seems trickier because mod was always our function that it would get a function that worked on the property and would update the property and then we would build a structure around it. So translating that mechanically to this example, we're saying we're gonna get a function that works from Fahrenheit to Fahrenheit and we need to construct a function that works from Celsius to Celsius that does the same thing. Okay. So we get our function, we get our temperature, and we know we're gonna want to apply that function to the temperature. But the types don't line up. So we're gonna do something that's really common with uh, virtual lenses, which is apply this sandwich of transitions. We're gonna first convert our temperature in Celsius into Fahrenheit, and then we're gonna pass it to our Fahrenheit to Fahrenheit function but the object expects a temperature in Celsius, so on the way out, we're gonna convert it back into Celsius. Let's, let's see this in action. Uh, I have this weather structure. It has a temperature of 35 degrees Celsius, but I don't know what that means. Uh, I, can, I can get that temperature, but you know, I still, I, I don't understand. So I can say, okay, give me that temperature in Fahrenheit. And now I see, oh, it's 95 degrees. Okay, I know what that means, that's great. Uh, but again, this is, this is just a lens, so I can modify this structure as well. I can say, uh, modify the temperature by incrementing it one degree Fahrenheit. And you see the result is that I get a structure that's been incremented by five-ninths of a degree in Celsius. And this is kind of, this is very neat. There's, there's another top-level function called set that is just like mod, uh, except it ignores the input. So it says, hey, I just want to set the temperature to 23 degrees Fahrenheit, and what we get back is, oh, great, yeah, that's, uh, that's negative five degrees Celsius. You're good. Uh, this, this is actually a really compelling reason for this library, and this trivial example might not seem like it, but I imagine everyone here has worked on some code base that has just gone through years of neglect, and there are just layers of data representations that each new lead developer has introduced. And half of the code expects the data to look like one thing, and half the code expects the data to look like another, and you have a bunch of algorithms that work on these, uh, these structures. And you constantly get faced with, okay, I, the right algorithm that I want expects the data in this different format. Do I re-implement the algorithm? Do I refactor the code? What if that breaks something else? I don't want to, it's so much, it's not worth the time. Well, by just creating virtual lenses that convert between these date, different data formats, I don't have to update anything. I can actually create a whole data pipeline from all of these different layers of, you know, the, the mantle from my code base, and just by applying the right lenses in between these, uh, these algorithms, I will get a data flow that doesn't even know that it is working with data in a different format. It can be reading and writing it uh, trivially. Uh, another really cool thing virtual lenses can do is, uh, is answer one of the most common criticisms I get, which is that you know, this is all well and good, but you're working with deeply nested structures, and I'm a good developer, TM, and I don't use deeply nested structures. I normalize all my data. And that's great, and I'm proud of you. Um, but <laughs> I put it to you, you probably don't think of your data as normalized. You think of a user as having posts. And you think of posts as having comments. You know that when you actually write the code, you're gonna have to do a bunch of threading back to the top level, but the structure is still nested. So just write a, a virtual lens that will let you view your normalized data store as if it was a denormalized data store. And now, you're just, you're, everything's declarative, you can write code the way you think instead of playing to your cache. Now, if that's all they could do, that would still be pretty cool. But there's more. <laughs> uh, for one thing, every lens that we've talked about so far has been one-to-one. -one. We've taken one piece of data in, and we have output one piece of data. But often, we have many things. Arrays are cool. Maps are cool. It'd be nice if we could use them. 
So one type of virtual lens is a fold. And a fold basically says when I reach a collection, I'm just going to roll everything up and I'm going to pick one of the elements. I'm going to roll it up into one constituent element uh, that really, you know, that personifies this collection. So I think this works better with an example. So here is, uh, if you want to try this out, by the way, uh, NPX shades, there's a little playground you can play with. Um, everything we have been talking about, you know, the store is in here. Um, our first user, Jack, you know, everything is sort of easily available. So Jack is a, is a member and they have posts uh, and I could, I could say, hey, give me uh, the posts, the first post and give me its title from Jack. And I get the title and that's great. But very rarely do I know that I want the first item in a list or the third item. I want the item that has the most likes or I want the item that fits some criterion. And that's exactly where folds come in because I can say, instead of saying I want the zeroth element, I can say I want the max by uh, likes, for example. And I'll get that. And again, these are lenses, so I can modify through them as well. I could say, hey, modify the max likes. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna hop on the bandwagon and I'm gonna say uh, increment the likes. I like the one that has the most likes. And you can see 70 just jumped to 71. But again, our original structure is completely safe. So folds let us go from specifying I want this item to I want the item that fits this criterion. And that's great, but we still have the problem that I'm still getting to a collection and picking one item. And very often, I want to get to a collection and do something to all of them or do something to just the elements that fit this criterion, but multiple items. You're still in luck. I'm still selling. I still got more. What you're talking about is a traversal. Traversals when they reach a collection, split their focus out. And instead of having a single focus, they have multi-foci. So again, this, this works better with examples. Um, so if we remember our, you know, we could get a single post from before, we could get a single title, but what if I wanted all of the titles? Well, there's a nice traversal called all. And now I get a list of all of the titles. Or I can, and again, these are still traversals, so I can just, you know, hop on the bandwagon. I like Jack a lot, and I am going to increment all of his uh, likes. And now everything has been applied. Traversal, traversals nest in a very nice way. So if I have my entire store, I could say get uh, users, get all of them, get the posts, uh, get all of them, and get their title. And now I get a list where for every user, I get a list of all of their uh, titles. And I can, again, I can use these nested things as, as modifiers. I can even use criterion-based uh, traversals. So maybe, maybe I like a good underdog and I want to find Jack's worst post, and I want to give that some, light, some love. Uh, I could say, okay, I want to modify, uh, actually, let's see. Yeah, I want, to, I want to find all of the users, and I want to, I want to give everybody's worst post, uh, or low posts, a, uh, a little bit of love. I can say, find all the users, find their posts, and find only the matching posts that have likes that are less than five. And yes. And get the likes and increment them. And now if I get all of the users and posts off of that, I'll see that I have incremented all of the worst posts.
posts. Traversals really open up this whole world of <coughs> describing collections of data and doing multiple updates at once. So let's try to put this all together and go against our, our boss battle. So let's imagine I'm given this uh, edict by my business department. We're going to find all the users that are not currently gold members. We are going to find their top post. And if it has more than 10 likes, we're going to mark that post as featured. And we're going to upgrade them to gold status. First, let's write this without shades. Um, it's, you know, it's pretty straightforward. We're going to we're going to go through all the users. We're going to see if they're a gold member. We're going to go through all their posts. We're going to see if it's the max post. We're going to save it into a map. OK. Um, now we're going to do the update. We're going to copy the users. We're going to copy the store. And for each user, if they're a gold member, then we're going to, they're going to stay a gold member. But otherwise, we're going to, whew, this is getting really complicated. Um, and in fact, this, this pretty straightforward code actually has two pretty serious bugs in it that will break on certain stores. And it's, again, it's not very trivial to just look at this and see what it's doing or know that it's doing the right thing. So what if we wrote this with a lens? Again, not only is this shorter, but it reads like the problem description. I am going to get all of the users. I am going to find those users who are not gold members and whose posts contain a post whose likes are greater than 10. What am I going to do to those users? Well, I'm going to use update all. Update all simply sequences a bunch of updates. And I'm going to say, well, set their gold member status to true, look in their posts, find the one that has the maximum likes, and set its featured status to true. Boom. So to wrap it up, in my humble opinion, Shades is a pretty great library. I think you should use it. Uh, it gives you a whole syntax for describing your data updates that not only is succinct and terse and typable, but lets you spend a lot more time simply saying what should happen to your data and much less time worrying about how that should be done. You might think, you know, this is great, but I don't do super complicated updates like that. And I'll tell you, I didn't either until it was this trivially easy. I hope you check out the library. You guys have been great. And uh, enjoy the rest of your talks. All right, thanks, James. Thank you.